This is a look back at Kissimmee's ugly racist past. This happened over 100 years ago, and it had to do with a lynch mob that formed in Kissimmee when they were looking for a black postal worker. Ultimately changed his life. I have Cristobal Reyes here. He's been looking into this, and this one is a real mystery. And the ripples still seem to be unfolding right now. Ultimately, the man that it affected was Oscar Mack and his family. Let's go ahead and start back at the beginning and what happened. So to start from the beginning, Oscar Mack had won a federal contract over white applicants to carry mail from the post office in Kissimmee to the train station. And the very same day he started working, he was threatened uh, with his life. He was told that he had to leave town by noon or else. So he was given a gun by a white assistant postmaster named C.C. Collins. He does his rounds, no problems throughout the day. That same night, around 10 o'clock at night, a group of men show up to his house, shots were exchanged, two men were killed, and suddenly he was in the wind. A, a white mob starts looking for him, they're trying to lynch him, and by the end of the week, he was just gone. But there were rumors that he and the, post, uh, the assistant postmaster had been lynched, although the federal government had said that C.C. Collins had been uh, taken away to Tampa and later to Jacksonville, they couldn't really account for Oscar Mack. Um, so you had, for a long time, people thinking he was either dead or he had escaped. No one really knew for sure. But in reality, what had happened is that he was able to escape Florida um, with his family, uh, changed his name, moved to Akron, had a whole other life. Uh, until he died in 1960 and his uh, many in his family including his uh, great grandchildren were none the wiser uh, they didn't know who he was until 2001 um, and then the story kind of goes into uh, just kind of how they found out and, and and sort of how they were able to piece that together um, since then let's back up a little bit too like at that time florida was just terrible about this it seemed like with lynching as far as it was it was historically known that florida was was one of the places that it would happen and it this story just goes to show that like how things just got lost how how information got twisted it's you didn't know who was giving you the right information and even like the authorities whether it even be the the news you just weren't sure what was happening and this seemed to be one of those cases where the stories just overlapped and no one knew right i mean the one of the things that i noticed um uh, and you know researchers who have worked on this project before have noticed is that the media at that time, they went through great rhetorical lengths to uh, obfuscate the fact that the Ku Klux Klan had been involved in the shooting in the first place. So the two men that Oscar Mack had killed, they were members of, of the Klan uh, at that time. This was uh, found in a report by federal agent Leon Howe, who had also investigated the Okoe massacre two years before that. So. You know, you had authorities saying that the, the Klan wasn't involved, even though many of those same authorities, including the Osceola County Sheriff, had ties to the Klan, uh, were saying that there was nothing, they had nothing to do with that. Um, they were calling it a case of mistaken identity, even though uh, a report in the Kissimmee Valley Gazette seemed to suggest that the men knew who Oscar Mack was before the shots were fired. That's, that's not a case of, of mistaken identity. Um, so it's, it's very interesting to see the, the political dynamics and the racial dynamics at play at the time, especially when we're talking about the 1920s. This was almost like the, the heyday of racial terrorism. I mean, we're talking about, you know, two years before, two years before Okoe. Uh, it was some time before the, uh, the raising of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, uh, the destruction of the black community in Rosewood. You know, a lot of things were going going on in that time, and but the unique thing about this story is that not only uh, was Oscar Mack able to escape and live to tell the tale, but he was also able to hide his identity for so long to the point where even his family, or at least, you know, his descendants, didn't know about it until decades after his death. And that's something that a lot of uh, Black families and uh, who have had relatives who uh, had this happen to them can't say the same um, about. Yeah, so let's touch on on where he ended up and what he did. It's interesting because there's still that mystery of like, no one really knows for sure how he truly fled, but they know he did. But it, as you mentioned, he seemed like he was able to go on and live a full life. What did he do? So in terms of his escape, um, one of the things that kind of was to his advantage is the fact that he was a soldier in the U.S. Army uh, during World War I. So this was a guy who was trained. This was someone who uh, presumably was a very good shot, 
was someone who knew how to survive in the elements. He had served overseas in France um, and was able to escape uh, without any sort of detection. Uh, after he escaped, he you know, jumped from city to city, often uh, on the basis of his wife's dreams of uh, being caught by the clan, which he took as being premonitions that they were still on his trail and they were getting close. Um, and in that time, he was able to find jobs. He um, you know, kind of bounced from city to city looking for work uh, to the point where even his wife had written letters to him saying, hey, you should you know, come home. Like, we want to spend time with you. Um, and even after everything that had happened, he still filled that registration card for World War II under his alias, Lanier Johnson. And, you know, even though he wasn't selected to fight in that war, he did work for the Goodyear Aircraft Corporation, uh, and he won an Army-Navy E-pin for his work in those factories uh, during the time where industry was mobilized for the war effort. Yeah, and I, I know this is one of those one of these stories in history that you can't just sum up really quickly. Um, ultimately, though, what I found interesting is in an article you wrote, you actually spoke to the family members of Mac and of one of the men that was killed that day, and and it was interesting that there was this like the families came together and and kind of talked about it, which I thought was just this. I, it's almost as unheard of unheard of part of this right now. So I remember when I first reached out to Renee Bronson, who's the great granddaughter of Stuart Ivey, who was one of the Klansmen who was killed. Um, the first time I spoke with her, she I had it was really awkward because I wasn't sure going in if she knew about the story. I didn't know what her beliefs were. Maybe she would have, uh, you know, said something about the situation that wouldn't have you know, just wasn't favorable to the family or anything like that. But I started describing to her what I was calling her about. And she interrupts me. She goes, wait a minute. Are you talking about the affair with the black postman? I was like, yeah. And she goes, you're telling me he survived? And I go, yes. And immediately she lets out a sigh of relief and goes, oh, thank God. This was a question that she had wrestled with for so long, wondering what had happened, um, whether or not Oscar Mack had gotten away. Um, and when I told uh, his family about it, I, I mean, I asked her permission, hey, is it okay if I connect the two of you just to have that conversation? Because the big thing that the family has been looking for in, in, with regard to the story is reconciliation. James Brown, his great grandson had said that this isn't, he doesn't want the story to be told just to, to fester the wound. He wants it as, uh, uh, as a way to reconcile the history is passing to have people learn from it. So having them together on a two hour video call um, was a, was, what they told me was a significant step toward that. Um, and it was a, a very interesting conversation, um, you know, but after the pleasantries and all that, it, it immediately became a conversation of apology, even though James Brown recognized this was Bronson's ancestor. She wasn't directly involved in it. She didn't even know that he was a member of the clan until you know we approached her about it. So you know, just the the, the fact that they were able to to have that conversation a hundred years later um, was was something very powerful. Um, was very something very powerful to witness.